The global strategy aims to achieve a more coherent and effective foreign and security policy that is relevant for contemporary times. It aims to give the EU a, sense of, a collective sense of direction on important matters such as energy security, migration, climate change, terrorism, and hybrid warfare. Malta is the EU's southernmost member, and it is located the closest to southern neighbours. Uh, these are receivers of official development aid and also countries of origin of thousands of migrants that reach European shores. But first and foremost, they are, are our closest neighbours. And what happens there impinge on our prospects, on our fears and our hopes. Malta's strategic position in the Mediterranean, as well as the upcoming presidency of the European Council, present us with an opportunity to play a central role on the global stage of foreign affairs. We are a small island state. We may not be powerful international players, but at least since Helsinki, Malta has always insisted on putting peace and security in the Mediterranean region on the international agenda. We have enjoyed ample soft power in the region, and Malta has gained an even, an even stronger voice as an EU member state. It is not surprising that the Mediterranean region will be the focus of the Maltese Presidency, as well as migration, which we know are all priorities for the EU High Representative. It is most appropriate that this event is held here at the Mediterranean Academy of Diplomatic Studies, MADAC. MADAC is a prestigi prestigious institution of higher learning in diplomatic studies, with a unique focus on the Mediterranean region. And I know, even from my own prior travels in the region, how well respected it is in the field. So, Your Excellency Ms. Mogherini, Minister Fella, I order that we have a fruitful debate and that we will have the opportunity to welcome you and your colleagues on other occasions during the presidency. I will pass the microphone now to Honourable Minister George Fella. Good afternoon to everybody. <coughs> May I say that I'm really happy and honoured to, to have the opportunity to welcome Her Excellency Federica Mogherini to, to, to Medec and to the University of Malta and also to have her introduced to the student community um, of which I'm seeing quite, quite a good representation. I know how committed um, uh, Federica Mogherini is with you and uh, I'm therefore confident that this is going to be a very welcome engagement in her program and I'm sure that she's going to, to enjoy every minute of it answering your questions. The representative is in Malta at, at, at this time on an official visit in preparation for the Maltese presidency of the Council of the European Union that, as you all know, will kick off on the 1st of January of next year. And as a matter of fact, she has had already in discussions with me and also with the Prime Minister and also with our colleague, Mr. Carmen Arbella, um, on the role and on the, on the prospects that we're seeing um, during this presidency. We had, as I said, fruitful talks this morning um, in which we discussed the priorities and also we had um, sort of a tour d'horizon to, to try to see what are the problems that are there already at the moment which we'll be facing during those six months and also the possibilities of other issues cropping up um, as we go along. Um, we all know that the Mediterranean is quite predictably one of these priorities in the, in the, in the presidency, but as I'm saying, other issues can come up as, we, as, we, as the months pass. In her role as High Representative, um, uh, Ms. Bogarini has never shied away from giving due importance to the Mediterranean issues and bringing them to the forefront of the European agenda. Our region, as you all know, is currently linked in with conflict, <coughs> instability, and socio-economic challenges. Countries in the Middle East and North Africa are facing serious crises, ranging from socio-economic problems to violent conflicts. A very important aspect is youth, unemployment, radicalization, and environmental degradation and migration. And you can see there is a nexus practically between all these issues and that can bind them together um, in one way or another. Ms. Magarini is the architect of the European Union Global Strategy something that she has launched recently and uh, on which she's working and working hard 
um, but not only on producing a document, but a document which we all are trying to give our fair share to help her um, um, in very close cooperation to help her um, implement, because this is very important. Um, uh, it deals with, uh, obviously, it needs the cooperation of member states, it needs the cooperation of European Union institutions, and also um, a broad um, foreign policy community, community um, at large to help implement these issues. We too, with other member states, have actively participated in this exercise and fully support the ultimate goal of a stronger Europe. This strategy has been invested with unprecedented value when one considers the emerging scepticism that the Union has recently become exposed to. And this is something which um, we all have um, uh, to, to reflect upon when we're seeing certain trends and certain movements that are saying quite clearly we are not 100% satisfied with the way the European Union is functioning. So it, is, it rests on us and it is our duty to try to see that we communicate the European Union to, to the people uh, on the demand in the street and also to deliver what um, has been um, promised um, at times many years ago. As I'm saying, this document will guide the European Union's foreign policy for the next few years, and it will ensure that the European Union maintains its role as an important and relevant global player. <clears throat> the, the focus on the Mediterranean um, is certainly a welcome aspect um, from our side, obviously, and especially when, one, when we are aiming at the enhancement of state and societal resilience in our southern partners. Um, I just um, say that Malta will be working very closely with, with Her Excellency in the coming months on this and several other dossiers to ensure that the European Union, as I'm saying, remains a credible and a reliable, a reliable international partner. I'm seeing many young people here. I can address you by saying that, that you, you, I mean, have a role to play towards the achievement of this goal. And I urge you to invest the energies of your young age to defend your values, to contribute to the dialogue and mutual understanding, which, I, which the international community so dire lacks at the moment. So I leave you um, in the hands of, of Her Excellency to, to listen from her about the Mediterranean and, and the global strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you especially, uh, all of you standing there in the back. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, I take it as a very uh, good sign of attention and uh, enthusiasm uh, for our common union uh, and uh, the work we can do in the Mediterranean in particular. And indeed, uh, George, it's really always a pleasure for me to meet uh, uh, with students. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be back in Malta. For an Italian like me, this is uh, quite home. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's good to see again the sun after months in Brussels, <laughs> and uh, eat uh, proper food, <laughs> but uh, I'll try to be serious. Uh, I, I, I start by saying that last time I was here in Malta, um, that was for the summit on migration uh, we had with African countries one year ago. And today I come here uh, straight from Tunis, um, actually closest than Brussels uh, to Malta, uh, and this tells you all, I think. This tells you all, uh, especially in the fact that uh, sometimes uh, people tend to think uh, of Malta as the edge of Europe, sometimes the periphery of Europe. Actually, in the world of today, it's uh, rather the gate of Europe, which means also the heart of Europe, because in the world we live in, gates and uh, uh, doors are the center uh, of our uh, systems. It's more about connections uh, than about uh, separate systems. It's a world with multiple centers, centers for growth, centers for progress, for exchanges among cultures. And there is no doubt that the Mediterranean is one of the key centers of our world. Seen from far away, seen from Latin America or Japan, when we asked about uh, the European Union foreign policy, when we were asked about uh, Europe, we are often asked about the Mediterranean. Because if you look at the world, the Mediterranean is the place with the highest intensity of crisis and conflicts. 
and this is where we live. So, and I promise I come also to the positive and the opportunities. But it is clear uh, that this is a region that is at the center of the world's attention. So it couldn't be differently uh, than, as it states, the Mediterranean at being at the center also of the European Union global strategy. But it's not just conflicts in our neighborhood. This is also a region of immense opportunities. Half of the population of the southern shore of the Mediterranean is under 30. In Europe, we have rather the contrary trends. So we might be complementary to each other also in demographic terms. But there's also an immense thirst for progress and innovation. We sit at the connection of three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and many, many more culture within each of the societies that are sitting around the Mediterranean. Inside each of them, you find a mix of different culture. Now, I believe strongly that Europe is a global power and shapes our world, our present and our future, only when we engage decisively in the Mediterranean. Maybe this can be obvious uh, uh, for uh, an Italian, a Maltese, many of us in this room, but I think this is true as a European, not only as an Italian or a Mediterranean. I think this is clear to all of us. All of us, not just the coastal countries, we are engaged, we are convinced that the Mediterranean is at the center of our entire Union, from the Atlantic, from Portugal to Ireland, to the Baltics. This sounds, again, very obvious to you. This sounds very obvious, uh, for sure, to me, to George, to all of us in this room. But let me tell you that just a couple of years ago, I started actually exactly two years ago yesterday, uh, parts of our societies, parts of our leaderships, didn't necessarily realize how important this region is for the entire continent. And I remember very well a time uh, of our common work uh, where we had to struggle a bit to put the Mediterranean on the agenda. Today, sometimes I have to remind our uh, European friends uh, that uh, we also have to continue focus on the East of what is happening in Europe. But this to say how much things have changed in terms of priority and focus in the last two years. Indeed, it is because crisis and conflicts, uh, but also some opportunities, uh, have brought the Mediterranean uh, very high on the world agenda. But it is also uh, because uh, we have invested politically in our role in the Mediterranean. Uh, somehow, knowing very well, this is a test. If we live at the center of the most complicated, complex region in the world, it is our responsibility to take care of our region, to take care of our relations with our region, and also this is uh, uh, laying the ground for a credible global role of the European Union. The first test is close to home. So the Mediterranean today, I would say, is not only a preoccupation or a top priority only for the countries of the south of Europe. I think we can confidently say today that the Mediterranean is top priority for the entire European Union and not only on the conflicts, but also on the opportunities. And it is central to our global strategy. The Mediterranean is somehow, I would say, the place where the entire European Union is testing itself, both on opportunities and on crisis. Now, I'll mention two, three issues that are obvious to all of us, I think, why and where we need to focus our attention as Europeans in these days and months hopefully not decades. One is Syria. One of the greatest tragedies of our times that unfolds at the very gates of Europe. It's clear that we don't have a magic wand to end the war in Syria, and it is quite clear that no one has, and that the solution will require a different combination of factors. All global powers, all regional actors, and all parties on the ground playing their role. Although Syria is so close to us, we know very well we cannot solve this crisis alone. But this is no justification for doing nothing on the contrary. And this is why I was in Iran and in Saudi Arabia in the last few days. 
engaging with all actors, regional and local, to start working on the future of Syria. And this is also the reason why we keep working very hard, together with the United Nations and humanitarian agencies, on easing the humanitarian situation in Aleppo in particular, but in all these aged areas. And I just noticed that uh, um, the Russian uh, authorities extended uh, uh, a cessation of hostilities or humanitarian posts uh, for uh, some more um, days. It might sound uh, too early or too optimistic uh, in the current situation with uh, fighting going on uh, in Syria so intensively to plan and to work with the regional powers on the post-war, on the post-conflict in Syria. And this is what we are starting to do with the regional powers. But we have decided, together with the foreign ministers of the European Union just a few weeks ago, to start this work first because we believe we cannot repeat the mistake of being unprepared for the day after of the conflict. So many conflicts of today are the result of non-managed post-conflict uh, moments. So it is wise to start preparing for the day after, when the day after still seems very far away. Because we know that stabilization, reconstruction, reconciliation is part of making the peace a victory. Once you manage to end the conflict to an end, sometimes you still have to win the peace. And that is the most delicate moment uh, in a conflict uh, uh, cycle. And this is what the COVA strategy calls uh, an integrated approach to conflict and crisis, engaging at all stages of conflict with all players and with all our tools. This means, uh, again, uh, preventing further problems down the road. But we believe, and we decided to do so, uh, we believe it's important to start working on the post-conflict in Syria today, also for another reason. Because starting the work on post-conflict, reconciliation and reconstruction can open the way for some common ground that can lead to some positive dynamics also in the immediate term if we manage to bring some degree of consensus on some elements of keeping expectation laws uh, also in, in the immediate terms. Also because the positive leverage that the European Union can play is about offering a scenario for the future, giving a hope that at a certain moment the conflict can end and the country can be rebuilt, with the Syrians taking the responsibility of that, but with the potential cooperation of regional powers, including the European Union, accompanying uh, a moment of transition, reconciliation and reconstruction. I know it sounds too optimistic, it sounds too visionary, but um, as we were all remembered recently uh, with the, uh, the commemoration of a great Mediterranean uh, politician and uh, statement, uh, Shimon Peres, uh, that left us a couple of, one month ago, um, Dreaming about uh, uh, a great future is what uh, uh, makes you work uh, for achieving it. And you're never too optimistic when you do our kind of job. So this is what we're trying to uh, establish. Uh, a pattern for regional powers uh, to come together and uh, share some uh, positive views on what the city of tomorrow can look like with the unity that the country will need to keep and with the differences of the society that will need to be protected. This is also something we are uh, trying uh, to do in Libya. Now, I imagine that uh, in the Q&A part, we will have the chance of discussing uh, more about both Syria and Libya. But on Libya, let me just say one thing, that uh, the Maltese presidency uh, in the first six months of 2017 I think represents an excellent opportunity for all of us in the European Union and through the European Union, I would say, for the entire world, to focus even more than we're doing now on trying to solve the situation in Libya from very close. Because this is something we also experience, uh, and maybe you have some experience directly, uh, some of you in the room, uh, that. Uh, especially on the southern shore of the Mediterranean. Sometimes when you refer to Europe, you think of Brussels or Paris or Berlin or London 
or even more than, than that, well, actually, it's just half an hour flight. Uh, so this closeness, this being part of the region, this being part of the culture, we eat the same food. And this tells us everything. We speak similar languages. We understand each other. We can work with each other. I believe the Maltese presidency can help Libya to find its own way, Europe to find its way to accompany Libyans in finding their own way, and the international community and the regional players to accompany this process in a constructive and active manner. We need more. But uh, beyond the crisis, we see also that uh, there is a huge potential uh, around our sea. Uh, and again, I see our sea, I say our sea, uh, not as an Italian or being in Malta, but I say this as European, because uh, this is the first thing we have to repeat ourselves all the time. Uh, this is our region. This is our Mediterranean Sea. There's a lot of potential. I was in Tunisia just yesterday, this morning, early, and what you see there is a country that has invested in democracy. There is a youth, half of the population, that has hopes and dreams and frustrations and uh, looks towards Europe uh, in terms of values and uh, projection. And you see a European Union in Tunisia, but I take just Tunisia as an example, as I was just yesterday there. You see there a European Union that supports the economy, accompanies the transition, works with the young people, especially in creating jobs and opportunities for um, those that uh, just got a degree and uh, sit in a cafe. Trying to invest in the potential. We don't need to invent the potential of the Arab world. We just need to let it express uh, and, and find its own uh, way of flourishing. Uh, obviously, also a country that sees radicalization as uh, a major problem, as we see in Europe. We sometimes tend to see still relations uh, in uh, a scale uh, or with paradigm that are not uh, properly uh, those of our times, as if Europe had found all the answers to all the questions, all the solutions, and still the south of the Mediterranean trying to catch up. My impression is that we share in our societies many of the same problems, from youth unemployment to youth radicalization, and we need each other to find respective solutions that might be different from one society to the other, but uh, it's not anymore that one side helps the other. My impression is that we need to help each other to find uh, new answers to questions we share uh, and, and develop all the potential we have there. Potential in the field of human capital, potential in the field of uh, uh, youth and exchanges, potential in terms of energy or trade. When we talk about energy, we often refer to the need to, to diversify our energy sources, well, the Mediterranean, being at the east of the Mediterranean, or Algeria, or Africa, is a perfect opportunity for Europe to diversify its energy policies. So, it's a lot of positive agenda on our table as well. But all of this, managing the crisis, or the post-conflict, or preventing some, or working on the diplomatic track to find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or exploring the potential of our trade relations, or economic ties, or energy ties. All of this works only if we work as a union, as a European Union. If you look at North Africa, or if you look at Africa as such, there are millions of young people looking for a job and for a good opportunity. Look at the demographics, look at the world economy. You would see giants, continent-sized powers, look at our common security in Europe, in a world where no superpower alone holds the key to global peace. No one. And finally, everybody realizes that, or almost everybody. But none of our member states, none of them, has the power, has the resources, has the size to go it alone. And I don't say this because I'm in Malta. 
I always say, always say, in Berlin, as in London, as in Paris, as in Malta, as in Cyprus, wherever, I always say that there are only two types of member states in our European Union. We have the small ones, and we have the member states that have not yet realized there's more. But in our world, that's it. But, but, we have something that others in the world don't have. Actually, we have something that no one else in the world has, which is our union. So we shouldn't be scared about the science issues. We should be aware of our potential and our strength. I sometimes say, and people look at me uh, a little bit in a strange way, especially uh, in the last uh, months, that the European Union is a superpower. And I think we should be aware of this and also proud of it, of being Europeans. Because sometimes we don't realize the power we have. And if you don't know about your power, you don't use it, you lose it. So what are we? Together, we are a union of half a billion citizens, the first world economy, still, after eight years of economic and financial crisis. The first trade partner everywhere in the world, the first humanitarian donor everywhere in the world, the first provider of development assistance everywhere in the world, and I could continue. So, I could continue, including the fact that we are, in most places of the world, in partnership with the UN, or with NATO, with our allies and friends, a global security provider. Because our soft power doesn't mean that we don't have our power. It means that we use our hard power in a way that is complementary to our soft power. We use it the European way, which is different from any other. And I can say it being here in a country that uh, uh, has a clear uh, constitution and a clear policy on that. We have a special way even when we use our hard power. This is a lot. This is a lot. My impression, doing the <coughs> wonderful work I'm doing, is that, seen from the outside, sometimes the power and the strength of the European Union is seen more clearly than seen from the outside, from the inside. What I hear in Washington, rather than in Buenos Aires or in Seoul, is that, you're big, you're the European Union, you're great. Kerry, visiting Brussels just a few weeks ago, gave a wonderful speech on the transatlantic relations, finishing by saying, you, I wish you could believe in yourselves as much as we believe in you. I would print this bit and put it in all universities, all schools of the European Union, because sometimes we tend to forget how much we have. And again, be proud of it and use it. This doesn't mean everything is perfect. Far, far, far from that. Far, far, far from that. But it's like if sometimes the European Union uh, was living in a sort of um, existential uh, crisis. Well, we're not teenagers anymore. We're turning 60 next year. <laughs> so it's time we're confident and self-confident about what we have. Because despite the mainstream narrative, and I know very well the mainstream narrative, is that we are divided, we're not united, uh, we're divided on everything. Actually, despite the mainstream narrative, we are already acting as a union, as a true union in many fields. Actually, on foreign policy, uh, and George can, uh, uh, can confirm that on most of issues, if not all issues in foreign policy, uh, you wouldn't find one uh, easily uh, where we are divided. We might have different views, but this is a plus. This is our strength. We're living in different geographies, being in Malta give you a different perspective than living in Tallinn, or Schwartz, or in Dublin. But, and we have different histories. But this is the richness of Europe. So I always say, don't look at the ways in which we bring different views and different identities inside our European debate. It's only good if these views that we're bringing together are different. But see what comes out of our common decisions. If our common decisions are united, that is what it counts, what counts. Not the fact that we come into our common room with different views. The important thing is that we decide together what we do together for our common interests and values. And um, on most issues of foreign policy, if not all, 
Um, we do decide to work together in the same direction and for the same purposes. People refer to this normally as uh, speaking with one voice. This is an expression I hate because I think that our strength, our richness, is not speaking with one voice and it's not our democracy. Uh, in every single country, sometimes in every single political party in Europe, you have different voices. Uh, still, the important thing for me is that our different voices, the pluralism of our voices inside our European Union, sing the same song, represent the same narrative, and most of all that we work on a daily basis putting together all our different instruments, different European institutions, different European member states, different bodies, <coughs> parts of the society inside our member states, towards the same objective and coherent policy. A union that decides together and the union that manages to deliver together to its citizens. I'll give you one example, a couple of examples, two, then I'll stop. Both related to the Mediterranean, in fact. One is Operation Sophia. You might know our military operation, EU flag, in the Mediterranean. Decided, uh, uh, we decided to set up this uh, military uh, operation to disrupt the networks of human traffickers in the Mediterranean but also to save lives, because to me, as an Italian, but most of all as a human being and as a mother, it was a shame to see that the European Union was not acting when hundreds of people were dying in the Mediterranean. It's true, we're still <coughs> facing too many people dying at sea, as we are facing still too many people dying in the desert. We should not focus only on those that we see on TV. There are many more that we've not seen on TV, that are in chains, crossing the summer. We established this, this operation. Uh, that was one and a half years ago, and I remember very well, we decided in uh, May, and uh, I was told uh, by our excellent, um, excellent teams in Brussels, um, you know, it will take minimum six, seven, eight months, it will be winter. And I said, but you know, this is an emergency thing, this is urgent, people are dying at sea. And people are dying at sea in the hands of criminal organizations that are making money out of people's desperation. And those money are, by the way, probably financing other kinds of activities. So it's urgent we act. We established the operation in one month. That was a record time, which means that Yes, we can, someone would say, but that when we have a clear political objective, when we know its importance, and when we are together, united, and determined, things move fast, even in Brussels. But it's true, there's a lot of decision-making procedures, there's a lot of, some call it bureaucracy, I don't like this, because I have to tell you, I see in Brussels civil servants that work in a wonderful manner, uh, so I think it's fair to recognize the professionalism and the dedication of all those people. But it's true, our decision-making is complex because we're 28 complex countries. But we managed to establish a military operation in one month, being operational a couple of months later, being endorsed by three consecutive UN Security Council resolutions adopted by unanimity. Isn't this a great expression of the fact that the European Union can be operational, united, deliver, because we saved uh, in, what, one year and a half, tens of thousands of people with assets from 25 member states, being endorsed, as I said, by three United Nations Security Council resolutions, and now starting a new tasking, and also having arrested several uh, smugglers and seizing uh, the assets. Again, this will not, it's not magic wand. This would not solve in one day, in one year, in two years, the entire problem. But this is the union that works. Take a decision, make it operational, create international consensus, start achieving results. This is the union I like. This is the union that is possible to build. We are also working on uh, now another step of Operation Sophia. And I would like to mention this here because I believe that Malta 
uh, first of all, uh, is uh, contributing in a wonderful manner to this effort, but also uh, can help us uh, in the next steps. Uh, the next steps are just started uh, a few days ago, uh, the training of the Libyan Coast Guard. And here I come back to Libya. This might sound a small thing, training of the Libyan Coast Guard, but it's actually uh, a major development. And I'll tell you why with one anecdote. Some of you might uh, uh, have heard about a movie uh, called Fuoco Mare. Uh, the uh, cast uh, are all brave, resilient people from Lampedusa, including the doctor of the island that has over years seen a number of uh, people in desperate conditions. And every time I met them in the island or in Brussels or elsewhere, they were passing me only one message, do something for the Libyan territorial waters, because most of the people are dying there. Well, as you know, because you are all studying these issues, EU operation can operate in international waters. So we don't enter Libyan waters. But what we can do is to work with the Libyan authorities. I know plenty of, <laughs> plenty of question marks of what the Libyan authorities uh, can do, what are kind of territory they cover, but the key is here working in partnership, empowering. And so the fact that we start now the training of the Libyan Coast Guard so that they can do the dismantling of the networks of traffickers more effectively in the Libyan waters, potentially before they start, and saving lives inside the Libyan waters is going to be the element that is going to be more effective, both in terms of dismantling the, tra the traffic of networks and also in terms of saving lives. This is one example of uh, what uh, we have, I think, uh, achieved in terms of working well together uh, in a joint-up approach and in partnership uh, with our neighbours. There's another one that is uh, also linked to migration. Uh, and having said that, uh, not only the Mediterranean uh, was not too much on the agenda two years ago, uh, foreign policy of the European Union, migration was a non-existing topic for our foreign policy, which was, I believe, uh, quite surreal, because it's quite clear that the migration uh, phenomenon is not something internal to the European Union, it's something that uh, has to, uh, to be dealt with uh, starting from our work with the partners. But uh, let me tell you one last uh, example of our uh, EU at work. Uh, the work we've done here one year ago with the Valletta Summit. I think uh, this is exactly uh, just been the turning point of our approach on migration. For the first time, probably, uh, we uh, started to realize that cooperation and partnership with uh, our partners uh, was the key to migration, to manage migration. I don't say stop migration because I am one of those I'm often attacked uh, when I say that, but I, I tend to say the truth. I'm convinced that uh, for demographic, economic reasons, Europe needs migration. The point is that Europe needs migration to be managed. But if you imagine a European Union territory from which all migrants would disappear tomorrow, you would have a major, major economic and social crisis. Entire sectors would collapse. So the point is not stopping migration, the point is managing migration. Make it sustainable, make it work, and make it work in full respect of the people. Because we always refer, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm starting to get too long. <laughs> That's always my problem, I never follow the written speech and then I start talking. Um, I'll, I'll stop very soon, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but most of the people in Europe referred last year to the refugee crisis as a European crisis. We have to focus on the fact that refugee crisis, as well as the migration crisis, is first and foremost a crisis for refugees and migrants, not for us. I see some of you nodding, speak out, because this is a cultural fight inside our European Union. We have to win, <laughs> because it's human beings, it's people, it's not numbers, it's stories. And if you look in their eyes and you hear those stories, and you think of the European past, when our fathers, grandfathers, mothers and grandmothers were traveling across the Atlantic, or Atlantic North or South, or across other oceans, to find a proper life. 
we should be a little bit more, um, let's say, sensible. But having said that, we need to manage migration better. So what we did in Valletta last year was to decide together with the African countries partnerships to manage migration together better. We uh, had babies uh, out of uh, that summit uh, that were you know, physical babies, <laughs> at least I'm not aware of, <laughs> could be. <laughs> but we, we started to work on migration compacts, starting with five uh, priority countries in Africa, uh, countries of origin and countries of transit. And we started also uh, to um, put in place something that I believe will be revolutionary, which is a European external investment plan to bring private investors in Africa, accompanying them, sustaining them to face the risks in going in fragile states. Complicated. Accompanying them also in policy dialogues, security measures, and priorities in terms of sustainable development objectives. So not for the sake of making money, but for the sake of sustainable development of these countries. This is a work that is starting to bring results. Sitting at the table with our partners in Africa, not with the approach, we have a problem, we need you to solve it, but we have an issue that is affecting our societies, your societies, and millions of people in the world. We have the instruments together to make it sustainable from a human rights perspective, from an economic perspective, from a social perspective, and try to make it work. And I believe this shift in mentality, slowly, too slowly, but still it started, will bring the real results. And I'm glad that it was exactly the approach that the UN General Assembly took uh, last September uh, with the Global Compact. Uh, this is uh, the key that is there in the global strategy uh, that uh, describes well the work we are doing and that resonates a lot in the Mediterranean, in our sea, in the sea we share with our neighbors which is the word resilience. As George was mentioning, building resilience of states and societies, because it's not anymore the time for uh, the illusions of strong men states, but rather of strong societies uh, that make strong the institutions of their countries. So during the last years, uh, we have focused a lot on crisis management, Tackling the emergencies is obviously a must, but it's not enough. Uh, now, I believe we are together concentrating more on preventing the next crisis, the next emergency, building resilient states, resilient societies, and following every single step of crisis and conflict cycles so that we avoid conflict and crisis to come back after the acute peak is over. Of course, our work on resilience doesn't start tomorrow or today, it's already ongoing, we, but we need to focus and streamline all our tools <coughs> in a much more effective way. And I think we have good examples all around Europe of instruments we can use uh, in a more focalized, focalized in English? Focused. That's the next step. That, that's rather the time, I guess. Uh, a good example, for instance, here in Malta, is the Institute on Criminal Justice and the Rule of Law uh, that is doing an excellent job training judges and security forces from Africa uh, on terrorism cases. And it's a good tool for counterterrorism that we must integrate with other policies of counterterrorism that we have. Or another instrument, again, we have, and they were here just last week, the Anna Lind Foundation doing an excellent job uh, with uh, especially young people. And this idea of bringing together young leaders from across the Mediterranean uh, and exchange and, and think of the future of our common region is exactly the key. And I would like to thank Malta and George for uh, the hospitality and the great leadership shown in, in having this uh, Young Leader Summit of the Mediterranean. We're going to follow this up in Brussels uh, for sure. I'll stop here just to say that I believe that really engaging with the young generations across the Mediterranean and across Europe is the way not only to build the future, we always refer to young people as the future, it's the present, and we should realize that. The Mediterranean, I think, shows us very clear it's the present. It's our sea, a sea full of history. Sometimes it's a heavy history, sometimes it's bringing problems uh, more than, uh, than dreams. But I think I'm convinced it's a common sea that is also full of future. 
provided that we uh, build this common future together. And this is something that really requires your work together with ours. And this is why, if you allow me today, I would obviously be pleased to answer your questions, but I also would like very much to um, listen to comments or suggestions or indications of what you believe would be a good way of dealing as the European Union with our common region, which is the Mediterranean, with a global perspective. Because if we manage to get the Mediterranean right, on track, that would not be only beneficial for the European Union or for the Mediterranean, that would be the best, best contribution we could give to global security and global stability. And also, if you allow me this uh, to say, uh, to make the center of uh, the most ancient cultures and civilizations contribute to the world uh, again as uh, we can. Thank you. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this uh, sharing your thinking, wisdom, insight at such a, a historic moment in our Mediterranean. I know our students are extremely enthusiastic, you can see. I think enthusiastic is an understatement. So uh, at the risk of and also recognizing the essence of time, I'd like to open immediately if you could kindly identify yourself and especially also be brief, uh, but to the point so that we can take a few interventions, if that's okay. So, the floor is open, if I may, please. Mohamed. My name is Mohamed Kausa. I'm from Egypt, and uh, uh, I'm a MEDEX student. Um, I would like to indicate your last visit to the Middle East and visiting two important countries engaged in the Syrian crisis. And actually, you have chosen two countries with totally opposed the, the, point of views uh, regarding the Syrian crisis. So according to your meeting with leaders in both countries, do you see any horizon for solution in Syria? And is it trying to find a common background or European Union has its own vision trying to export it? Thank you. Thank you. May I take a cluster of questions? Because I already saw about I 10 hands. I get, I get a pen. Try. I, I can help you out there. As an academic, we have a pen. So I see many hands going up. Thank you for that's okay. And also, perhaps we can have a, an exchange as a conversation. So I see a microphone already, please. Hi. And then I have another three yeah. over here, please. My name is uh, Steve Caruana. Um, I just want to ask some, uh, something uh, bring in the common agricultural policy. I know it's not possibly related to the immediate discussion, but the, I believe it is. The common agricultural policy currently takes up, correct me if I'm wrong, over 40% of the EU budget. It in a way subsidizes uh, the European agriculture. Does not this, in your opinion, prevent the African nations that we are trying to help from developing their own uh, agriculture, and would it not, if it were reformed, assist in uh, alleviating the cynicism that exists within the common European? Thank you. Thank you. I have another question right here. Then, please. You have your hand up first. If anybody wants to sit, please, because time is a challenge. I would like to follow up the analogy you that you just given. I'm Lynn, I'm a student from Malta. From Malta. Taking up the song which you were talking about and the voices, the different voices of the in Europe within the EU states, um, it is very nice to have different voices, but the overpowering voices and those voices which are out of tune within Europe. How is the European Union coming about with implementing a common approach and uh, imposing such uh, approach onto European states who continue to oppose to the benefits of coming together? Thank you. I believe those that have been standing for an hour, please, if you can hand the microphone. I think the least we can do is allow, and then perhaps another. 
Yes, Stefan Kudayer from the Faculty of Laws. Um, you spoke about the unity of Syria as a priority for you in the future. Um, how does this reconcile with the Kurdish question um, and with the question of Assad being deposed or not? Yes, please. Excellency, I am Rosalind Seker from The Gambia. Um, regarding the European Union's credibility in world politics, particularly uh, with regarding providing effective and uh, immediate solutions to dealing with instability in the European Union, it is evident that the European Union is challenged in terms of managing an impressive uh, track record of managing its single most important challenge, that's the external challenge, which has to do with stabilizing its neighborhood. So my question is making reference to your statements, which you said the European Union is a one of union, meaning it is a very uh, exemplary in terms of value. So it is natural to expect that the European Union will do all that it can where it is with what it has, and that is the neighborhood, that is the Mediterranean. So however, what new strategic or new pragmatic result yielding and sustainable approaches or strategies is the European Union focusing on to manage migration and refugee crisis within the European Union? Okay, I see a hand that's been up for a long time. I'm not as tall as I thought. Yes. And then behind as well. Uh, okay. Then I think we have to bring it to... This is uh, Shil Badrawi from Egypt. I'm an Iraq student. And my question is related to the uh, uh, energy security of the European Union and the cooperation with the Mediterranean. Uh, it is what are the prospects of cooperation possibilities with southeastern Mediterranean countries in the light of increasing gas reserves punches in that region? Please, the young man with Welcome. microphone. I'm Giorgio from Italy and I attended the operation Sofia for two months until May to April, the last one. And my question is this one. And uh, everybody knows the position of Italy in uh, the Italian problems and uh, the financial uh, situation. And this uh, effort is equally shared by all the uh, European uh, members. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was another. Was it okay? Hello. Yes, please. My name is Abdul Rahman from Palestine. I'm a little expert. I just want to ask you about what you said as uh, the European Union is a uh, superpower. What do you think it can play in the future in the Palestinian Israeli conflict? And what should we do better and more to? make the situation better for persuading peace and achieve it. Thank you very much. I know time is... But the students want to share their... It's and your, your, your intervention was so inspiring. And it was so long. And so no, but long. also, no, I, uh, to the extent of the students would really like it, and if that's okay. But Momentarily, so please. Thank you for sharing your views and knowledge on uh, uh, tackling uh, human trafficking. Uh, I'm Maureen from the Netherlands, and I'm wondering, um, you already uh, gave us a step that is taken towards tackling human trafficking. Uh, could you give us some more examples of what the EU can do to more effectively address human trafficking, especially in the Mediterranean? Thank you very much. From Yes, right next to you, the microphone. Hello, my name is Nena. I am from Ukraine, medic student as well. I have such a question uh, about Syria. What kind of preparation do you mean when you are talking Syria after conflict? And uh, what's the European uh, vision about Russia involvement in uh, Syrian conflict? Thank you, Messi. There's been one hand up throughout, so please, I, I apologize. And that'll be the final intervention to allow Her Excellency. Well, one, two. I know yet. So please, yes, you've had your hand up. I want to tie in with the other questions that were about Syria and the Kurdish question. What about identifying the Kurds and what they're trying to do in Rojava and Afrin and Kobani as partners and helping in their reconstruction and in their institutions? And of course, there is the question of expansion into non-predominantly Kurdish um, areas. Thank you very much. One final intervention and then Her Excellency. Your Excellency, um, you were you became high representative during an interesting time. Um, the, it, Italy had its, pres its presidency of the Council, and then there was Meyer Nostrum, Operation Triton. Um, do you see it as quite curious that um, after Operation Triton kicked off, Malta did not receive any more migrants, while Italy has? 
and then your deck stops working if, um, in other words, which basically pre presents a conundrum to the EU um, by balancing security and freedom. Um, Could you kindly identify yourself for the... Uh, no, Lee, uh, from over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, please. Thank you. Uh, well, a lot of questions, some, uh, not more than questions, or maybe it's enough. More than questions, some uh, comments or suggestions or uh, things that uh, might take a bit of time to discuss, uh, like the Kurdish one or the role of Russia in, uh, in Syria. Uh, difficult for me to wrap up in, uh, in a few minutes. But if I can uh, comment on some of this. Uh, first, Iran, Saudi Arabia, you didn't mention the names of the countries, so I thought it was good for, for me to share with, uh, with your colleagues. Uh, I'll also visit Turkey uh, soon, and uh, hopefully also others, uh, Egypt, Qatar, uh, other countries in the region. Yes, I am positive, uh, I'm always, but I'm positive on the fact that m there can be some common ground, some elements of common ground, among different regional powers that have very different visions on the present and in maybe immediate future of Syria during the conflict, but I believe there is a common ground with some elements of common interest that can constitute a base for uh, those regional powers to facilitate uh, intra-Syrian discussions on the way forward. The unity of the country could be one. The fact that the country cannot uh, turn into a black hole for decades because we simply sharing the same region cannot afford uh, having a black hole uh, next to us, or uh, finding some ways of guaranteeing at the same time the unity of the country and the diversity of the country. These are all elements on which the European Union doesn't have its own agenda to export or to impose, as you put it, but could, given our own history of reconciliation and post-war reconstruction, which is a rather long one, uh, provide some uh, common neutral space uh, for different regional powers to come together or some advices or some accompanying uh, steps to fit into the UN-led process. I want to be very clear on this. Uh, this regional work we're starting uh, is all in connection and not in substitution. Substitution also is Italian. Uh, it's not to substitute or to replace current uh, formats or current efforts. It has nothing to do with the cessation of hostilities. It has nothing to do with the immediate need to find a breakthrough for Aleppo. We're not a military player on the ground. It's not for us to find the immediate solution on the military side. But we are a diplomatic and humanitarian power. And uh, we have some experience on reconstruction and uh, governance and reconciliation that we can maybe put at the disposal of the Syrians and of the regional powers to see if we can facilitate uh, something of this kind. And yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm rather positive, as you can be on anything related to Syria today, but um, I am. Uh, energy security. Uh, Southeast Mediterranean countries' uh, role is uh, excellent, potentially a game changer. Uh, I was in Cyprus a few days ago. Uh, I believe the uh, possibility, the window of opportunity we have now for the unification of the islands and having one united island that is European could be uh, a game changer for uh, the island itself and its citizens, the entire southeast of the Mediterranean, the relations between Turkey and the European Union and the neighborhoods, also Turkey and Egypt, potentially Israel. There's an all constellation of relationships that might change if that click uh, happens in the coming months. And I, as the European Union, we're supporting the process of talks uh, among the Cyprus uh, leaders uh, very strongly. Uh, because, again, also in terms of energy security, this could open uh, very interesting uh, channels. Um, EU member states uh, are equally sharing the efforts on migration. Uh, the Italian question, I was sure about that. <laughs> um, I can tell you uh, very openly, on the external side of our work on migration, yes. I see in Operation Sophia, and you've seen it yourself, 25 member states, European flag, all of them present at sea, where two years ago it was Italy only present at sea. On the inter- and this goes much beyond Operation Sophia. In Africa, the migration compacts, we're building them together with member states, 
joining in a marvelous manner efforts from different European institutions, European Commission, uh, the different member states, having joint visits, high-level visits, uh, a foreign minister with uh, a commissioner, different commissioners having different portfolios, working and traveling together to some uh, African countries that are priorities for us. I think today, even, uh, Gentiloni and Avamopoulos are together uh, in Africa visiting some of these countries. So really, a joint up approach, and all member states very much behind uh, our, our work, doing really a teamwork. On the internal side of migration management in the European Union, I believe it's a different story. I believe that there uh, we finally put on the table as a commission here, I have different hats. As a commission, we put on the table proposals. Um, it's more difficult for all member states uh, to implement decisions that the Council took on the proposal of the Commission and the Parliament took. And I have said several times, our external work will not be sustainable and will not work at the end of the day if we don't manage to make the internal solidarity work for an obvious reason. People in need of international protection need to be protected and need to be resettled. And this requires member states to open up through clean or orderly managed channels, uh, international agencies, UNHCR. Uh, we cannot see anymore the flows that, uh, in a disordered manner, were arriving in Europe last year. But this doesn't mean uh, that uh, this is going to disappear, or this is going to stop. People are on the move in the world. And Africa and Asia are internally uh, hosting more refugees and migrants than Europe. So uh, we should simply do a reality check and realize that we need to do it properly, orderly, sustainably, not if, anyway, you understand, uh, in, in a way that is fully respectful of, of human rights, but we need to do it. And uh, I believe that member states on the internal side of migration policies uh, and asylum policies need to do much more in solidarity terms. Uh, and I know in Malta, I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the converted. Um, Middle East peace process. Uh, the European Union role uh, is important. We are friends of Palestine and we're friends of Israel. And this is the approach we need to uh, keep, to build bridges. We have chosen to invest in two uh, dimensions. One is the work we're doing with the quartet, because we need to give an international framework to um, the lack, the hope or the effort to re-establish the peace process, because in this moment you cannot refer to the East of peace process, there's a lack of process. But at the same time, the European Union is uh, working uh, with the key Arab countries at the center of the Arab Peace Initiative. I believe the conjunction between the Quartet efforts and the Arab Peace Initiative and can, and the Arab League, can make a difference uh, in the uh, relaunching of the peace process between Palestinians and, uh, and Israel. Obviously, this requires also internal political conditions on both sides, including the reconciliation uh, on the Palestinian camp. And here you can tell me more than uh, what I can tell you about. <laughs> um, there were many other issues. Um, what more we can do on human trafficking in the Mediterranean? I've, I think I've thought a lot, uh, who, who was asking, uh, yeah, you were asking. I, I think uh, I've focused a lot on this. There's one thing that I believe is strategic, which is to focus not only on the Mediterranean, but on the Sahel. Because the flow that comes to the Mediterranean goes all through Libya. 80-85% goes through Agadez. That's why we have started to work in Agadez with the authorities of Niger, we have a presence on the ground, together with the IOM, offering economic alternatives to the communities there, because otherwise, you know, Agadez was, used to be a center of tourism, uh, and now it's the same buses that were bringing the tourists around, uh, bring people around. Uh, and uh, investing also in the capacity of the authorities to uh, managing the borders in a difficult desert area, and uh, working in partnership there. So I've always been convinced that, yes, we have to work on the Mediterranean. Yes, we have to work on Libya, obviously. 
But we need to work on the root causes in countries of origin, offering economic opportunities, good governance, participation, human rights, role of women, space for youth. This doesn't change things in two weeks. But this, if we don't start doing this now, in 10 years from now, we will have exactly the same problems. So I believe the key is countries of origin and Sahel. Sahel, most of all, also for the connection with security issues. Uh, and uh, last, I'm sorry, some of your questions, uh, um, I don't have the time to, time pressure, okay. One, um, the first question, one, the second question was about uh, voices out of tune, um, just. Uh, it's not about imposing anything to anyone. And this is, uh, and I'm glad you, you asked the question because I'm so angry when I hear uh, people say Brussels asks or rules coming from Brussels. I believe Belgian government doesn't impose anything on anyone. <laughs> the only country, the only country that cannot afford this trick is Belgium. Because they cannot say Brussels us, because it's them. <laughs> but this is a good uh, uh, metaphor for all of us. Because in Brussels, I chair the council. I chair two formations of the council, and I take part of the European Council. So I see ministers and prime ministers coming more, sometimes more than once a month. So I see what happens. It's not, it's not, the European Union is not an abstract entity closed in a building somewhere uh, where people coming from Mars come take decisions and dictate to all the rest of the uh, Europeans. It's us, and then I, I was sitting as a minister at the same table, so I know how it works. <laughs> it's us coming together. It can be in Brussels, it can be in Malta, it can be in Bratislava, it can be whatever. It's us coming together and taking decisions together. We have to stop the scapegoating exercise of make, creating a distance between Brussels as an abstract entity and our own responsibilities. There are not only governments, there are also national parliaments, civil societies, and universities, opinion makers, opinion leaders. It's really us Europeans. And really, I believe the way out is re rediscovering the reason why we're together. And this is also part of the exercise we've tried to do with the global strategy. We published it two days after the referendum in the UK. And some people were telling me, you're crazy. No, it was a choice. There is a reason why each of our member states decided to join together. Because we know, we knew, that being together is the way to serve our own national interests better. So there is no distance between the national interests and the European exercise. It's a way of achieving our goals better, because we know that only together we can make it. Then it's a political fight, but not only in Brussels, also inside countries, in parliaments, in national parliaments, in national governments, in coalition governments, you name it. But it's, it's not something different from us, it's us. The European Union, it's us. Uh, th there's no distance. And I think this is the way of, uh, of avoiding voices out of tune. Uh, this of developing the sense of ownership, also putting at the disposal to member states the instruments to deliver to the citizens. When this works, the added value of the European Union becomes self-evident and you don't have, you can have political fights, that's part of democracy, but you don't have this distance, this discrepancy between far away entity and uh, actually some people say it's a, a way of ceding sovereignty. I'm fully convinced the European Union is the only way to regain sovereignty.